let's set up the recording. So we're continuing on with our discussion of interpreting resonance structures and indicating electron rich and electron deficient atoms in given and considering each of our resonance structures. So let's look at another example where we have a conjugated enolate in this case. So we're going to draw out each of our resonance structures and then from our resonance structures we'll be able to identify the electron rich and electron deficient atoms. So in this case let's start by first kicking our lone pair down to form a double bond. Our double bond breaks and we end up with a lone pair that in turn gives us the following resonance structure. Next, what we're going to do is we're going to kick down our lone pair to form a double bond that in turn breaks our adjacent double bond and we end up with the following structure. Okay, so we have identified our many of our electron rich atoms. Let's look at some electron deficient resonance structures just so that way we we can fully understand and interpret the structures for this molecule. So we can kick our double bond up and we can generate the following, not very major, but nonetheless important to consider resonance structure. So from this, let's now indicate each of our atoms that are electron rich and electron deficient. So first and foremost, which atoms are clearly electron rich? Which atoms are clearly electron rich? Oxygen. Oxygen, yep. Okay, starting off this next carbon in red. Uh, so all the negatively charged carbons we can say are electron rich. So the following alpha and gamma carbons are electron rich. What about the carbon in red? Is this carbon in red electron rich or electron deficient? Electron rich or electron deficient? It's electron deficient. So we denote it with a delta plus. So we've identified all of our electron rich and electron deficient atoms in the following structure using our major and minor resonance structures. Any questions on this example? Any questions on this example? Is everyone comfortable with these ideas so far? So let's now look at the following molecule and I'd like you to draw resonance structures for the following molecule and indicate the electron rich and electron deficient sites in this molecule. This motif here is known as an imine and is also seen a ton in general chemistry too. So let's spend about three to four minutes on this example. Let's draw out potential resonance structures and we already have one of your classmates starting to draw out the arrow pushing for one of the resonance structures. And then once you have your resonance structures drawn, indicate the electron rich and electron deficient atoms.
and I would just double check, is that a formal charge or is that a partial charge assignment? Identifying the nitrogen as, elect as electron rich is reasonable, but let's fill in our other charges in this structure because this structure does have a localized charge. Yeah, exactly right. As one of your classmates noted, the carbon should have a positive formal charge. Would anyone let else like to contribute a second resonance structure? Don't be shy to chime in. Under the drop down menu under Canvas options, there's the ability to annotate. And let's try to get the second resonance structure drawn. Yep, we kick our double bond across. And that in turn gives us a new structure with a different distribution of charges. Yep, exactly right, exactly right. And the formal charge assignments look great in this structure. So now that we have our structures in place, let me rewrite each of these um, solutions just so that way we can draw out the common instructor solution. So first and foremost, we correctly kicked our double bond up to generate a lone pair and a cation. So here we go. Here's our first resonance structure with a positive formal charge on carbon. We're then gonna kick our double bond across to generate another resonance structure. So this in turn gives us the following resonance structure with a positive formal charge on the rightmost carbon. So based on these resonance structures, based on these resonance structures, which atoms are electron rich? Which atoms are electron rich? Which atoms have a large amount of electron density? Nitrogen. Okay. And now, what atoms are electron deficient? Which atoms lack electron density? Which atoms have a positive formal charge? The two carbons with a positive charge in our two resonance structures. There we go. So we've completely assigned our, our sites of electron rich and electron deficient atoms in the following molecule. Does this make sense to everyone so far? Perfect. So let's talk a little bit about localized and delocalized lone pairs. Recall resonance involves the overlap of parallel p orbitals and pi bonds to form an extended pi system. A delocalized lone pair occupies a p orbital parallel to a pi system and it participates in resonance delocalization. So what do I mean by that? So for example, if we have an amide like here, if we draw out our, if we get a sense of the orbital diagram here, so carbon has a p orbital that it is using to form a pi bond with oxygen. Likewise, nitrogen 
Its lone pair is held in a p orbital, and as a result, the lone pair can participate in resonance. So this nitrogen is sp2 hybridized, and the lone pair is delocalized as it's able to occupy a p orbital and delocalize across the pi system via resonance. Now, if, if the molecule's geometry does not allow for parallel p orbitals, or if the p orbital is perpendicular to the pi system, the p orbital does not participate in the pi system or experience resonance delocalization. Additionally, if a lone pair is not held in a p orbital parallel to a pi system, it will not experience delocalization. A localized lone pair does not participate in resonance. So for example, if we have CH3NH2, there's nowhere for this lone pair to go. And this lone pair in turn is held in an sp3 orbital. So a localized lone pair does not participate in resonance. Does this idea make sense to everyone so far? Localized versus delocalized? Could you do delocalized one more time? Ah, so in, in an amide, for example, the nitrogen containing a lone pair is adjacent to a pi system. So then if the nitrogen adopts an sp2 hybridization, you can place the lone pair in a p orbital and as a result that lone pair can overlap and interact with in the p orbital with the pi system and we can delocalize our lone pair across all of our atoms in the pi system. Okay, that, I see. Now for a localized lone pair, if it's they're stuck. It's stuck, exactly. And in turn, the hybridization of nitrogen is such that the lone pair is located rather than in a p orbital, it's located in an sp3 orbital or other hybrid orbital. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Thank you. So Looking at localized lone pairs, let's look at case one, where the lone pair is not held in a p orbital. So let's look at pyridine and nitrogen atoms with a bent trigonal planar geometry. So pyridine, we don't work with it a ton in the lab because it's carcinogenic, it smells, and it's not fun to handle if you're a guy. It's, it's, it, the smell is terrible um, and it has other deleterious effects. So if we take a look and we unpack um, the nitrogen, so if we unpack this nitrogen for a moment, what is the hybridization of this nitrogen? What is the hybridization of this nitrogen? If it has two bonds and one lone pair, what is the hybridization of this nitrogen? Sp2, okay? And this nitrogen has a p orbital that it is using for bonding. So it's used its p orbital to form a pi bond, right? So then, what orbital is our lone pair located in? What orbital is our lone pair located in? sp2. Yep, so this lone pair is in an sp2 orbital and this lone pair is stuck. It can't participate in resonance. Does everyone understand why this lone pair can't participate in resonance? Is this lone pair in a p orbital? So this is this lone pair no, it's it. the lone pair is in an sp2 orbital, not a p orbital. Ergo, this lone pair, k, 
cannot participate in resonance. So the lone pair is held in an sp2 orbital and it cannot participate in resonance. Perfect. Does this first case make sense? Does this first case make sense for localized lone pairs? Okay. So if we compare this to pyrrol, for example, there's a critical distinction between pyridine and pyrrole in that pyrrole, our lone pair is present in a p orbital. And we can show that because if we look at the nitrogen, the nitrogen has three bonds and it can adopt an sp2 hybridization to place this lone pair in a p orbital and in turn allow our lone pair to be delocalized via resonance. So we can very easily draw resonance structures for pyrrole showcasing this delocalization of electron density. For those who recalled our earlier example of an enamine, pyrrole often reminds me of an enamine in terms of possible resonance structures and possible sites of reactivity. Does this example make sense? Pyridine versus pyrrole. Does everyone understand why they have very different lone pair reactivity and very different lone pair behavior? Because the lone pairs are in different orbitals. Pyridine, the lone pair is stuck. Pyrrole, it's in a p orbital and it can be delocalized via resonance. Any questions before we move on to the next example? Okay, so let's talk about delocalized lone pairs. So make sure when you're drawing resonance structures, you only delocalize electrons through conjugated pi systems. If a p orbital is perpendicular to a pi system, the p orbital is not conjugated and does not participate in delocalization. Well, what does that mean? Well, let's look at alene. And you may say, well, this seems like a silly example. Obviously, all of our p orbitals are going to be conjugated, right? Well, this is where the geometry of p orbitals really comes into play. So, whoops, one moment. Sorry about that. There was a small skip, small delay in the Zoom call. So if we think about p orbitals, they don't all have the same orientation, right? The px and py orbitals have different orientations in 3D space. So when we have this central sp hybridized carbon, this central carbon is going to use its hybrid orbitals for bonding, OK? That's pretty boring. It's not really what we came here for. And when we think about our pi bonds, which are formed using p orbitals, we have one p orbital that's vertical, right? And our second p orbital is arranged on the horizontal axis. Now, this is where things get very interesting. Because if we think about the other two carbons, if we look at the structure of alene, and you're going to see a hint from how I draw my hydrogens, why am I drawing my hydrogens in such a weird way? Would anyone like to, like to 
propose, why am I drawing my, my hydrogens almost perpendicular to each other? What's so special about alanine? What's pretty special about alanine? And to help you, help you rationalize what's going on here, I'm going to put together a model of alanine. And our job is to explain what's occurring for alanine. And it's quite striking the first time students see this. So let me put together a model of alanine momentarily and allow me to show it to you. So I'd like you to ponder why are hydrogens drawn perpendicular to each other? And I'd like you to think very carefully about what do we need to form a pi bond? What do we need to overlap? What is used for overlapping to form a pi bond? So I'm almost done putting together the model for alene. Would anyone have a proposal? Why, why are the hydrogens drawn in a perpendicular manner? So just to give everyone a reference, here's what alene looks like. Here's what alene looks like. The Hydrogens are perpendicular to each other. And this stems from the fact, this stems from the fact that the p orbitals are perpendicular to each other. The p orbitals are parallel with only one carbon. Let's show what I mean. Let's show what I mean. That's a wonderful observation that we noted. Um, So, in order to form each of our pi bonds, we need the overlap of p orbitals. The two p orbitals on our central carbon are perpendicular. So to form our first pi bond, our carbon on the left needs to arrange itself so its p orbital is completely parallel with the p orbital found in our middle carbon. Since this carbon is flat, that means our hydrogens must be arranged vertically. Comparatively, our carbon on the right, in order to form a pi bond, must arrange its p orbital vertically, and its hydrogens thus are arranged in the horizontal plane. This is known as a cross-conjugated system. And these cross-conjugated systems are less stable than your typical conjugated system. Why? Because our electron density in these two pi bonds is not actually being delocalized across all three of our atoms. Why? These two pi bonds, our pi bonds, are perpendicular. And as a result, they are not conjugated. So that's why we get these very odd structures like this. And it's a direct consequence of the fact that p orbitals need to be in a specific orientation for bonding. Does this example make sense? So you need to be really careful and make sure that your p orbitals that, are, that you're claiming are participating in resonance and participating in delocalization are actually parallel. If they're perpendicular, there's no overlap. So let's look at an example, CH2N2. 
So let's let's look CH2N2 looks a little bit like this. So counting electrons, we have 10 plus four plus two, which is 16 electrons to work with. So CH2N2, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, would look a little bit like this. Now let's draw an orbital picture for CH2N2, otherwise known as diazomethane. So we have our first orbital overlap to form one of our pi bonds. And now to form our second pi bond, we have to use our, our second p orbital. And as a result, one thing that we can immediately notice is that our pi bond is perpendicular to our carbon nitrogen pi bond. However, for this nitrogen, we can place our lone pair in a p orbital. And would this nitrogen lone pair, would this nitrogen lone pair be able to participate in resonance delocalization? Would this nitrogen lone pair be able to participate in delocalization? Is it parallel to our pi bond? Yes. And that in turn can help explain why we can draw structures like this. So notice how the location of our lone pair and the exact orbital that our lone pair is located in can directly impact the energy and how readily that lone pair delocalizes and how that lone pair is distributed across multiple atoms. Does this make sense to everyone? This is something that you have to be pretty careful about because a lone pair that can delocalize is a very different lone pair than a localized lone pair. Does this example make sense? Perfect. So let's keep going now. And I'd like you to draw out and draw some resonance structures for the following molecule. So I'd like to see an or orbital diagram and I'd like to see some resonance structures. And this can really highlight something that's quite important when it comes to understanding potential sites of reactivity in a molecule. So I'd like you to draw a few resonance structures for this molecule. And I'd like you to indicate, and I'd like you to draw out the p orbitals that are involved in the resonance delocalization. And we'll discuss this example in about three to four minutes.
And don't be shy to use the annotate tool to draw out the structure and clearly label the p orbitals involved in bonding and resonance delocalization. And we'll discuss this example in about two to three more minutes. And don't be shy to use the annotate tool as I love to, to see your proposed response and, and to provide feedback on your proposed responses. And let's try to see some proposed responses in the chat and some proposed annotated drawings showcasing the p orbitals involved in bonding and resonance delocalization. And if you have a question on this example, don't be shy to ask it in the chat as well or verbally for that matter. Okay, so let's look at this picture and let's try to see what we can see. So first and foremost, if we're drawing out an orbital picture, we know that carbon is forming a pi bond with oxygen using one of its p orbitals. Additionally, there is an oxygen that has a lone pair and that oxygen lone pair can be held in a p orbital and it can participate in delocalization. Now, when we move on to this carbon here, this carbon here has a vertical p orbital and a horizontal p orbital. And the vertical p orbital can participate in forming and can participate in delocalization. Likewise, our second carbon also has a vertical p orbital, which it uses to form a pi bond, and a horizontal p orbital that it uses to form the second pi bond. Now, one thing that I'd like to make very clear is this horizontal p orbital, the, these, this horizontal pi bond, would you expect this cross conjugated pi bond to be higher or lower in energy? Would we expect this cross conjugated pi bond to be higher or lower in energy? Would you expect this cross conjugated pi bond to be more or less stabilized via resonance? Less stabilized via resonance, so we'd expect it to be less stable and higher in energy. The cross conjugated pi bond is not stabilized via resonance. Ergo, it's a, it's a less stable pi bond. Does that make sense to everyone? So you can call this essentially like a localized pi bond. That's one way of thinking about it. Because the electron density in this, in this cross-conjugated pi bond cannot be distributed about as many atoms. 
So then this pi bond is in turn not stabilized via resonance delocalization. Does that make sense to everyone? So just make sure you're attentive towards your molecular geometry and you're attentive towards the location and orientation of the p orbitals involved in your pi bonds because if your p orbitals are not parallel, you're not actually able to delocalize your electron density through your pi system. Does this example make sense to everyone? Okay, so let's keep going now. And thinking about localized lone pairs, let's approach the following example. And I'd like you to determine whether each nitrogen lone pair will be localized or delocalized. And I'd like you to indicate the hybridization and geometry of each nitrogen atom. And I'll label them as one, two, and three. So let's work on this example for about three to four minutes. And I'd like to see your responses in the chat for whether each lone pair on nitrogen one, two, and three is localized or delocalized and indicate the hybridization and geometry of each nitrogen atom. Accounting for resonance effects. So let's get working on this example. And if you have any questions in the chat, don't be shy to ask them in the chat or verbally. And let's try to get a few responses before we discuss this example, as this concept is critical for our next discussion of acids and bases. And if you have any questions, don't be shy to ask and don't be shy to submit your responses. I'd like to see a few responses for nitrogen one, two, and three, indicating whether their lone pair is localized, the hybridization of each nitrogen, and the geometry of each nitrogen. This is a very similar question to that which you may see on an exam. And don't be shy to submit your responses in the chat or ask questions in the chat. Let's try to get a few responses before we discuss. And does, how's everyone going working through this problem? Does anyone have any questions working through this problem? I'm noticing the chat's pretty silent, so I'll give everyone a little bit more time on this problem, but I'd like to see a few responses before we discuss.
and just make sure your hybridization assignments account for resonance effects. Let's keep working on this example and I'd like to see a few responses from different students as this example is pretty important towards our next discussion of acid-base chemistry. And really focus on what orbital is my lone pair located in. So in nitrogen three, yep. would, wouldn't that be a localized lone pair because it can't move anywhere since that carbon is sp3? Yep, and, exactly. Mm -hmm. Perfect. And it's also a trigonal pyramidal because of the lone pair? Yep, exactly. Yep, exactly right. So we have our first assignment that's perfectly correct. It's an sp3 nitrogen, has a trigonal pyramidal geometry, and it's a localized lone pair. Exactly right. Let's focus on one and two, and remember our idea of the pyridine versus pyrrole nitrogen. So this is a pyridine nitrogen versus a pyrrole nitrogen. And the reason why we focus on these nitrogen types, as these represent the two major types of nitrogens that you will find in most structures. And the pyridine and pyrrole nitrogen in the following molecule has substantially different properties and reactivity in terms of acid-base chemistry. So let's focus on getting some responses for nitrogen one and two and then we'll discuss momentarily. I'd like to see a few responses in the chat or verbally before we discuss. And let's try to get a few more responses in the chat working through this example. So just to, just to get a little bit more of a, of a response out of everyone, so for nitrogen one, which is right here, what do we think about that lone pair? Is it localized or delocalized? Is it localized or delocalized? Let's try to get a few more responses in the chat and just think really carefully about what orbital is this lone pair located in? I was gonna say it's delocalized because the carbons it's bonded to are hybridizing also, and thus it could partake in like, if you were to write conjugate uh, isomer. Uh, so you are correct that this, this lone pair can delocalize. And to show why that is, this is a typical pi, this is a typical pyrrole nitrogen in that the nitrogen forms three single bonds and it could potentially adopt an sp2 hybridization to place its lone pair in a p orbital. As there are adjacent pi bonds, if our lone pair is placed in the p orbital as a result of this sp2 hybridization, we can in turn 
delocalize our lone pair via resonance across multiple atoms. We can see this by the fact that we can draw a valid resonance structure via arrow pushing. So for nitrogen number one, it's a delocalized lone pair. In order to delocalize our lone pair via resonance, what is the hybridization of nitrogen one? What is the hybridization of nitrogen one? SP2. SP2, exactly right. And as a result, it has a trigonal planar geometry. So the actual, the actual geometry centered around each of these nitrogens is different. That's important to consider. Pyrrole is flat. It's not, doesn't have a, any bent character to it. Let's look at nitrogen number two now, which is right here. Let's try to get some responses in the chat. Is this a localized or delocalized lone pair? What do we think? Is it localized or delocalized? Is it in a P orbital or a hybrid orbital? So if we look at this nitrogen here, this is a typical pyridine nitrogen. Why do I say that? What's, what's the basis for that? Well, this nitrogen is forming two single bonds and one double bond. So as we discussed, this nitrogen is using a p orbital to form a pi bond. So then, what orbital is this lone pair located in? Is it located in a p orbital or a hybrid orbital? What do we think? Is it located in a P orbital or a hybrid orbital? If the nitrogen is already forming a pi bond, if it's already forming a pi bond, then wouldn't P orbital be full and thus it'd be in yeah. hybrid orbital? Yep, exactly right. So then this lone pair is in an sp2 hybrid orbital. So is this lone pair localized or delocalized? Localized. Localized, exactly. So we have a localized lone pair. Our hybridization is sp2 and we have a trigonal planar geometry. Does this make sense to everyone? Does this logic make sense? Differentiating between localized and delocalized lone pair, it's localized when it's in a hybrid orbital and it's delocalized if it can be placed in a p orbital that can be parallel to a pi system. Does that make sense to everyone? Does this example make sense? This one's really important because we'll see this again in acid-base chemistry. Any, any questions I can address before we move on from this example? If not, let's keep going. So let's have a second shot at this. So let's take a look at the following molecule and predict whether each lone pair will be localized or delocalized indicate the hybridization of each nitrogen and oxygen atom and predict the geometry. So I'm gonna label my nitrogens. And I'll, this will be your second chance now that you've received feedback to revise and provide your responses. So I'd like you to tell me for each of my nitrogen and oxygen atoms, whether the lone pair is localized, 
what is the hybridization of each atom, and what is the geometry. So let's spend about another four to five minutes on this example, and don't be shy to submit your responses or questions in the chat, or verbally for that matter. And don't be shy to share your responses in the chat, or if you have a question and are unsure, don't be shy to ask a question in the chat or verbally. And the responses I'm seeing in the chat seem reasonable, but for the oxygen, just like nitrogen, try to figure out where is that lone pair actually located? What orbital is that lone pair located in? Let's try to get a few more responses in the chat before we discuss, and we'll discuss in about another two to three minutes. Yep, exactly right. So as we've noted in the chat, this, the oxygen lone pairs are localized. They're held in hybrid orbitals. The oxygen is already using its p orbital for bonding. Exactly right. So let's try to get a few more responses in the chat and we'll discuss in about another minute and a half to two minutes. And really don't be shy to send or submit your responses in the chat. The act of attempting to explain your response and working through a problem and submitting your response allows you to more effectively re revise once you've seen the instructor solution and it allows you to more effectively integrate the material. And we'll discuss this example in about another minute. Okay, so let's discuss. So looking first at nitrogen number one, is that a pyridine or pyrrole nitrogen? Is that a pyridine or pyrrole nitrogen?
to pyridine nitrogen. Further, we notice that the nitrogen is already using its p orbital to form its double bond, to form the pi bond. As a result, what orbital is this lone pair located in? Is this lone pair located in a p orbital or a hybrid orbital? It's located in a hybrid orbital. So we have a localized lone pair And what is the hybridization of this pyridine nitrogen? What is the hybridization of this nitrogen? Sp2. Sp2, exactly right. And then finally, the geometry would be trigonal planar. Okay. Let's look at nitrogen number two. Let's look at nitrogen number two. So this nitrogen is adjacent to a pi bond, right? The carbon oxygen bond, let me draw this out a little more clearly. So we have our pi bond and the nitrogen is adjacent to that pi bond and it could potentially adopt a hybridization to place a lone pair in the p orbital. So my question to all of you is, what is the hybridization of this nitrogen? And is this lone pair localized or delocalized? What do we think? So it's delocalized, exactly right. We have an sp2 hybridization. And what would our geometry be then? What would our geometry then be? Trigonal planar, exactly right. Remember this motif, this motif is known as an amide. And amides, as we learned previously, are flat due to this nitrogen participating in resonance delocalization and this carbon nitrogen bond having a significant amount of double bond character. Let's look at nitrogen three now. So first off, my, my question to you is, my question to you is, is this nitrogen lone pair adjacent to a pi system? Is there any adjacent pi bond? No. So is this lone pair localized or delocalized? localized. Okay, and what is the hybridization of this nitrogen then? sp3, yep, exactly right. And so to have a trigonal pyramidal geometry. Perfect. Now looking at the oxygen, looking at the oxygen, if it's already formed a pi bond, where will its lone pairs be located? Are the lone pairs in a p orbital? For this oxygen. So the lone pairs are not in a p orbital. So are these lone pairs localized or delocalized? Are these lone pairs localized or delocalized? These are localized, exactly right. So for oxygen four, the lone pairs are localized. What is the hybridization then for this oxygen? Sp2, yep. And you could say the oxygen would have a trigonal planar like geometry. Does this example make sense to everyone? Yes. 
Does this type of analysis make sense to everyone? Could you go over the geometry for one, nitrogen one and two? Sure, sure. So for nitrogen one, in order for this nitrogen, so for nitrogen number one, the nitrogen is sp2 hybridized and it has one lone pair and two bonds. So it'd be trigonal planar. It would technically be the bent variation of trigonal planar if you wanted to be 100% accurate um, because it has two bonds and one lone pair and one double bond. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, the thing I use for my geometry always says bent instead of just trigonal planar, so that ah, confused me as well. Yeah, yeah. So like this bond angle here would be about 116 degrees. So it wouldn't quite be a full trigonal planar bond angle, but it'd be trigonal planar, the bent variant. Well, yeah, for me, yeah, yes, please that's, go ahead. Uh, that's because it has three, three areas of electron density. Yes, it has two bonded atoms and one lone pair. Okay. You can also think of it of, as the fact that nitrogen has an sp2 hybridization in order, and because the nitrogen has an sp2 hybridization in order to form this double bond, it has bond angles of about 116 degrees. I see. But hybridization can also impact the, the observed bond angles. Okay. For nitrogen two, because we have a lone pair adjacent to a pi system, if our nitrogen adopts an sp2 hybridization, the lone pair would be in a p orbital and it would be able to experience resonance delocalization and stabilization via this delocalization. So this nitrogen adopts an sp2 geometry and we can think of this nitrogen a little bit like this, which is its major resonance structure. And as we can see in this major resonance contributor, the nitrogen has three bonded atoms and sp2, geom sp2 hybridization, and as a result, it would be trigonal planar. So the nitrogen is flat because it's using its p orbital for, for resonance delocalization. Its p orbital is aligned and it's present in a way that it can overlap with our pi system. Okay, that helps a lot more then, all right. Does that make sense? Yeah. Perfect. Any other questions before we move on from this example? Okay, so let's keep going now. And let's look at conjugation and resonance stabilization. So in general, conjugated systems which are connected parallel p orbitals are lower in energy than non-conjugated systems. This effect becomes more pronounced the more atoms that are present in conjugation. So for example, this conjugated system is going to be more stable than this non-conjugated system. It's actually somewhat difficult to generate these non-conjugated systems because the conjugated systems are often favored energetically. So in general, just as a general rule, the more atoms you can delocalize charges, lone pairs, or electron density found in a pi bond across, the more stable the molecule becomes localized or isolated charges, lone pairs, and pi bonds are less stable than delocalized charges, lone pairs, and pi bonds. So in this case, these two structures on the left would be more stable in general than the structures on the right because we can distribute our charge and electron density across more atoms. Does this idea make sense? Is everyone comfortable with this idea? 
the more atoms that are participating in resonance delocalization, the more you can stabilize your charge and electron density, and in turn, the more stable your molecule or ion will be. Any questions on this before we move to the next idea? Now, of course, you don't, you don't just have to take my, my word for it. There, there, there are some arguments in favor of this. So first, there's the empirical argument. So if we look at the heat of hydrogenation for various carbon-carbon bonds, essentially, the enthalpy of a reaction represents the enthalpy of our bonds formed minus the enthalpy of our bonds broken, okay? So then, if you're comparing the heat of hydrogenation, a larger Sorry, there's a typo here. It should be a so the smaller heat of hydrogenation indicates a weaker higher energy One moment, let me just double check. Yep, so a smaller heat of hydrogenation would indicate a weaker and higher energy carbon-carbon bond. Because in hydrogenation, what we're doing is we're breaking our carbon-carbon double bonds and we are forming carbon-hydrogen single bonds. And the only thing that is different in our heat of hydrogenation studies is our starting material. So any differences in the enthalpy of hydrogenation will directly indicate differences in the energy of our reactants. So we observe that conjugated systems in general have higher heats of hydrogenation compared to non-conjugated systems. And because these conjugated systems in turn exhibit higher heats of hydrogenation, these conjugated systems are lower in energy than our non-conjugated systems. So for example, 1,4-pentadiene has a smaller heat of hydrogenation. And the reason for that is that 1,4-pentadiene is higher in energy. 1,3-pentadiene, which is conjugated, has a larger heat of hydrogenation. And in turn, that means our starting material was lower in energy. Does this make sense to everyone so far? So the smaller heat of hydrogenation for our non-conjugated system indicates that this non-conjugated system is higher in energy and overall less stable than the conjugated system. There's some additional empirical data to support this. Uh, the carbon-carbon the single bond in conjugated systems is general, in generally shorter and stronger than in non-conjugated systems. This is due to our carbon-carbon bond having some double bond character and more S character as well. So to help everyone visualize to help everyone visualize what's going on here, let's draw another picture. Let's draw another picture. So we're starting off with different reactants. So we're starting off with different reactants. So red we'll use for the conjugated system. One moment. So red we'll use for the conjugated system and blue we'll use for the non-conjugated. Okay, 
So the non-conjugated system is higher in energy and will eventually generate the same product. The conjugated system is lower in energy. So when we generate the same product, the delta H for the conjugated system is gonna be greater than the enthalpy for the non-conjugated system. And the reason for that is our conjugated system is lower in energy than the non-conjugated system. We're starting with different reactants and we're making the same product. Does this explanation clear things up? Does this make sense now? Could you go over what a conjugated and non-conjugated system would look like? So a conjugated system has multiple adjacent pi bonds where all of our p orbitals are able to overlap and participate in resonance. So this would be 1,3 pentadiene is an example of a low energy conjugated system, while a non-conjugated system is 1,4 pentadiene, where we have each of our pi bonds separate and are not able to overlap and engage in conjugation and delocalization. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Perfect. So conjugated systems are lower in energy. And we see this because it takes more energy to hydrogenate these conjugated systems. We have to put more energy in to break our carbon-carbon double bonds and generate our same product. Does this make sense? Does this energy picture help a little bit with visualizing this empirical explanation. So we know empirically that conjugated systems are lower in energy. We have to put more energy in to hydrogenate a conjugated system versus a non-conjugated system. Now there's another argument based on MO theory and this argument is one that I'd like you to be familiar with as this theme will pop up again when we discuss aromatic systems. So the MO theory, MO theory argument goes something like this. So with ethane, we combine two p orbitals to generate a pi bonding MO and a pi star antibonding MO. So this is, this is our typical bonding pattern for ethane, right? We've all seen this before. Now, if we look really closely at our pi bonding molecular orbital, if we look really closely at what's going on here, we notice that we're essentially taking two electrons and distributing it over two carbon atoms, right? We've spread our electron density in our pi bond across both of our carbon atoms. Now, electrons are stabilized by the nucleus of each atom. So the more atoms we can delocalize electron density over, the lower the energy of those electrons in that molecular orbital and in the molecule overall. So if we look at 1,4-butadiene, when we combine four p orbitals, we generate two pi bonding molecular orbitals and two pi star molecular orbitals. Notice as well that the bonding and antibonding orbitals are arranged symmetrically. So from this diagram, one, we note that our pi bonding electrons are now distributed over all of our conjugated atoms. And those electrons in turn are stabilized by each of the atoms in conjugation. 
So it's as if we were distributing our four electrons in our two pi bonds over four atoms. And in turn, our pi bonding character is also distributed over each of our four atoms. So then we have more atoms interacting with our electron density and we have more nuclei that are able to stabilize our electron density. Does that make sense to everyone? The more atoms you can distribute your electron density over, the more you can stabilize that electron density. Does that make sense to everyone? Does stabilize mean lowering in energy? Yes, stabilization results in a lower energy system. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. And that's also why if you look at the diagram, do you notice how much lower this first bonding orbital is compared to in 1,3-butadiene compared to in, oops, one moment. Sorry, there was a small amount of lag. Let me go back to that page. So if we compare 1,3-butadiene to ethane, do you notice how much lower our first pi bonding orbital is in 1,3-butadiene? Yeah. That's because we're distributing our electron density over multiple atoms, and that electron density is stabilized by each of our atoms participating in resonance, resulting in a lower energy molecule. Does that make sense? Yeah, I was just thinking that for some reason my brain thought that since it was bonding more delocalized, it worked the same way as like double and triple bonds do, which would like heighten the energy, but that's not the case, so. What, what you're probably thinking of is bond enthalpy, which is the energy required to break a bond. Yep. And Double and triple bonds are strong, so we have to put more energy in to break those bonds. But the, if, we, if it requires a large amount of energy to break a bond, that bond itself is relatively low in energy. Does that make sense? Yeah. Perfect. So we have two arguments put forward. Um, another argument that, that you will often see is the more the more p orbitals that we overlap to generate our conjugated system, in turn, the lower in energy our overall molecule becomes. Because we're more readily able to delocalize our electron density across multiple atoms. We'll talk about conjugated systems a lot more later on in this class and we'll talk about how to analyze conjugated systems and think about patterns of reactivity for conjugated systems. So, following our idea that the more atoms we can delocalize our electron density over, in turn, the more stabilized our atom, our atom and our molecule becomes. Let's look at the following example and let's ask which of the following molecules would we expect to experience the greatest amount of resonance stabilization. So these two molecules look very similar, but there's a critical distinction. So first, this substituent is known in the O or ortho position and we're comparing it to this substituent, which is in the M or the meta position. There is a huge difference in stability and reactivity of ortho versus meta substituents. So let's look and see, why is that? Well, in the ortho substituent, we can kick our electron density down and delocalize our electron density up into our carbonyl. Let's show a more roundabout way. Uh, let, let's just keep it straightforward for now. 
So we can delocalize our electron density on our ortho oxygen atom into our aromatic ring and up into our ketone. Can we do the same thing for our meta substituent? Let's try. So if we kick our electron density down, we kick our electron density through the ring and, oh, we have a problem here. Are we ever able to delocalize our electron density into our ketone in the meta substituent? So we end up with the following draft resonance structure. Are we ever able via drawing our resonance structures to get this electron density delocalized into our ketone? Is there any way with arrow pushing to get this electron density into our ketone? What do we think? No, there's no way, we're stuck. We can delocalize our electron density into our aromatic ring, but we cannot delocalize our electron density into our ketone. As a result, which of these structures, the structure on the left or the structure on the right, experiences the greatest amount of re resonance stabilization? Which of these two structures, the structure on the left or the right, is more stable? The structure on the right is more stable and it's overall lower in energy. At least considering resonance effects. And that is because we can draw a resonance structure where we can delocalize our electron density, not only across the ring, but also into our ketone as well. Does this example make sense to everyone? Does this make sense to everyone? How in drawing resonance structures, we see in one of our examples, we can distribute our electron density over more atoms. And as a result, that structure experiences a greater amount of stabilization from resonance effects. Does that make sense to everyone? Any questions on that example? Okay, perfect. So let's try to work on the following pair of examples. I'd like you to tell me which of the following radicals would you expect to be more stable and which of the following anions would you expect to be more stable? So I'll label these A, B, C, and D. Let's work on this for about two to three minutes and then we'll discuss this example. And don't be shy to submit your responses or any questions in the chat. And let's try to get a range of responses from the class in the chat, just so that way we have a decent pool to draw from in our discussion. And it would be really helpful if you, when you submit your response that you also include your reasoning. Why did you choose that response? What, what stood out to you? And we'll discuss this example in about another minute and a half to two minutes.
And you'd see a nice pool of responses. So let's discuss. Everyone's correct. B is definitely the more stable radical because we're able to delocalize our electron density over more atoms. For the anion example, you're correct in noting that we can, that we have a conjugated aromatic system. And this aromatic system in turn stabilizes our ketone which in turn stabilizes our entire molecule. So we have a highly conjugated system resulting in a lower energy anion. One thing that's pretty interesting to note, one thing that's, that's pretty interesting to note here is that even though we can't actually directly delocalize, even though we can't actually directly delocalize our electron density into the aromatic ring, the presence of a conjugated aromatic ring stabilizes our ketone and in turn results in an overall lower energy molecule. So Conjugation and resonance effects cannot just directly stabilize an anion by delocalizing that anion, but it can also stabilize your molecule overall by lowering the energy of your molecule overall. So C is a perfectly reasonable response. Do these examples make sense to everyone? Any questions on these examples? So this seems like a good stopping point. We'll have some examples to work on next 